Hello, Troy, and hello, everyone else out there listening and watching us on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. So this is one of the um, APS series talking to illustrious um, APS clients. But in this case, this person is really quite extraordinary. It's quite different because we are talking to the father, one of the fathers of Ian too, and uh, more than that, uh, Troy is a legend in our industry, and his career began in 1975 when he joined his father at Germano at the Hit Factory in New York City. And by 2002, the number of music studios un under his supervision has grown to 16 recording mixing rooms. It's just amazing. Six mastering suites and six writing rooms between New York and Florida. And obviously, these uh, these numbers are just but a few uh, from, from the very extensive history of Troy's. He has received a Tech Award in 2003 for studio design that was awarded to him for New York's new Studio 6. And let me just finish by citing a few clients that have gone through his studios, which are John Lennon, The Rolling Stones, Stevie Wonder, Paul Simon, U2, Madonna, Bruce Springsteen, and many, many, many others. Michael Jackson. Honestly, the list goes on and on. And I'm very happy, Troy, to have you here, to have accepted this invitation. We are very humbled. Uh, and... I would like to maybe perhaps start with the very beginning. Would you like to tell us a little bit about your story? Sure. Well, hello, everyone. And thank you again, Chris, for having me on this call today for APS and for Aeon2. Um, we're very proud of those speakers and this partnership between Germano Acoustics, which is my studio design company, with APS. I'm very fortunate to have uh, a great Polish partner, that's been great from the beginning, and now we're three years in to these speakers on the market. Um, so uh, I'll start back in 1975. That wasn't full-time. I was still in grade school, but I would work after school for my father. And then in 1981, when I finished school, um, I started to work for my father full-time at the Hit Factory when it was located uh, in New York City on uh, West 48th Street. Uh, we since have been to seven different locations since then. Uh, five in New York, uh, one in London, and one in Florida, which was Criteria Studios that for a short period of time became the Hit Factory Criteria back in 1998. And then in 2012, we sold Criteria, but not the Hit Factory name. So um, I stayed at the main Hit Factory from 1981 to 2003. And then in 2007, I started building Germano Studios, mm -hmm. uh, opening in May 12th of 2008. Um, about a year and a half ago, almost two years ago, I reacquired the Hit Factory name. So now Germano Studios, after 12 years in business, is now a dual branding effort, and it is Germano Studios, the Hit Factory. So it's come back into the family where it belongs, um, and it is the only Hit Factory on the face of the earth at the moment. Hopefully there'll be more being built in various cities around the world. But I started in 1975 uh, in the tape duplication room and taking care of the tape library when most of the tapes at the time, the multi-track tapes, were two-inch, either 16-track or 24-track. And then the Hit Factory started as two rooms, and it became three rooms. Then it got to 22. Uh, okay. Now it's presently back to two rooms, um, so the world changes a little bit. Uh, this is my NoHo facility in New York City, where we have Studio One and Studio Two. I'm presently sitting in Studio One right now. Both rooms are Solid State Logic 48-channel uh, Duality Delta consoles with a tremendous amount of out outboard gear, um, a large array of plugins, um, and a very deep Pro Tool system in terms of track counts. So we constantly upgrade and maintain and change equipment. Um, so, uh, I think we're on we're, we, we, we really make that something that we pride ourselves in. Um, but over the years, the coolest thing about the hit factory, uh, all the different locations, uh, is the different genres of music. So we work on rock records and hip hop records and rap records and trap records and music for film scores, uh, and for film and Broadway cast albums. Uh, pop records, some jazz. Uh, so it's a lot of everything. It's seven or eight different genres of music 
that we're working on here daily. Mm. Uh, the studios do go 24 hours. Of course, they've been on a hiatus for the last three months because of this world pandemic. But uh, we are ready and uh, trying to open shortly. So uh, hopefully our clients will be ready to come back into the studios when they feel safe. Um, but uh, again, the main purpose of the call today is to discuss Aeon 2, um, which I'm very proud of. Our Aeon 2 sit atop both solid state logic dualities in both rooms every single day. It's very rare they come off the consoles. So, you know, when we have uh, artists like Ellie Goulding and Kendrick Lamar, uh, the Rolling Stones, um, all these different artists that are constantly here. Uh, Ryuchi Sakamoto, the famous Japanese composer and film scorer. Um, these, cons- these, these speakers are on the consoles, and if they weren't really great, they wouldn't be there. So uh, they, uh, they, get a, they, get a, they get a good working every single day. That's really great to hear, especially that you know the studio is really one of the finest in the world, and the finest people get there. So if, as you say, if they didn't like them, they would basically ask for something else. Correct. Now, I would like to ask you about the very beginning of the design process because you've met you you've told us about your um, uh, work with studios, but you didn't mention you actually designed those, right? Yes, I do. I've been designing studios since 1989 when uh, I had a joint venture with Sony Music in the UK, mm-hmm. and we took over CBS Studios because Sony uh, in 1988 acquired CBS Records. Uh, as well as Columbia Pictures, um, besides being a hardware company in Japan. Mm-hmm. And in 1989, they asked us to be their partners in the studio in London, and it became the Hit Factory London. So at that point, 89, that's when I first really started to design studios with uh, uh, an associate of mine who's based in England. Um, and we've been doing it now for 31 years. It's a long time, many, many rooms, not just for the Hit Factory. But for people all over the world, um, you know, I was in, I've, I've done work in Prague and in Mexico uh, and uh, in England and really pretty much throughout the United States. Uh, the Red Bull facility in um, Santa Monica and Los mm-hmm. Angeles that happened just before I opened up Germano Studios. Uh, I started doing that in 2007. Um, so that's worked out quite well. Uh, so the design part is something acoustics I'm very, very deeply passionate about. So an opportunity had arisen where one of my engineers from Hong Kong had an online relationship with Ray Stadoni at at APS, Mm -hmm. and he had never met him. But then I actually met Ray, and Ray asked me if I wanted to be involved with uh, a branding of a pair of speakers. Um, And I think we gave a lot of input. Um, Of course, course it's the APS design. I'm not going to take credit that but uh yeah they were being very instrumental in this product we do feel the same way so would you like to tell us a little bit more about your your path in that design process what what were your feelings were your expectations from the speaker what were you ex- you know I, i just felt that i was only seeing between passive and active speakers consistently before i met aps consistently only seeing six or seven different models or brands from different manufacturers sitting on the consoles. Of course, Yamaha NS10Ms as a, as a, as a passive speaker. But there were, you know, I'd see Genelex on the console. Uh, some people like PMC, even though we didn't have any. Um, Proax are on the console. Um, but it always seemed that people would gravitate back toward what they were used to on the NS10s. So uh, we kind of focused on trying to have the vocal feel the same. That was kind of the, the purpose of the design. And I, and, and I thought a smooth, near-field, active monitor uh, that, I, I, in my mind, I kind of felt like, what would be the speaker, this is me personally, not necessarily my engineers, what would be a speaker that could have been developed 25 years ago that Peter Gabriel would have wanted to have on his SSLs at real world in Bath, England, because, you know, this is a great record maker and someone that I've always, uh, you know, looked up to and admired the, the record making skills of him as a producer, as well as being an artist. And I think we achieved that here. So it was really a lot of listening and testing and, and notes going back and forth, as you know, hmm. with, with APS. And I think we stumbled upon this after four prototypes 
Um, and it's now been three years. So it's, you know, it's, uh, it's a slow build because it's a new product in yeah. a very crowded market. Um, but I think it's been great for us and I hopefully great for APS. Uh, but I think there's, you know, many big days ahead uh, and I think we're just scratching the surface. There's so many more people that mm. we need to reach around the globe, which we will do. Well, thanks to you, we are reaching far more than we could have ever hoped to because it's, you know, well, I I hope that's I hope that's true, and uh, I, I think I could even do a better job. So I need to market even more so because I'm very private. Even though we have all these incredible artists and bands and clients in here, I really uh, am kind of protective of their privacy. Sure. So I need to maybe be a little bit more extroverted and not introverted with this, and try to get them to help us. Because if they didn't like them, they'd want them off the consoles. Or if they were bad, it would be embarrassing that they're on the consoles. And it's neither. It's not that at all. So I sure. think they do speak for themselves. And when people really critically listen and they compare them to the other, you know, speakers that are out there, Genelex, Folk House, PMCs, ATCs, they compete. They compete. They really do. And it may be, it may be in some cases they're superior. Uh, when, when they see the speakers in your studio, do they actually link the name Germana to you and ask you about it? I don't know. I mean, you know, that, that was one of the things that, Uh, Ray and I kind of agreed upon in the beginning when I started Germano Acoustics. We could have called them Germano Studios, but I just felt maybe other studios would want that on their console. But I think some people figure it out. I mean, it is subtle. You have to look closely to see it, but we did that intentionally. Um, I mean, really, you can see APS better than you can see Germano, but that's better. Um, I think subtle is is, is uh, the right approach here, and I think they do notice. And you know, I don't, I don't, I don't kind of, uh, you know, kind of it's the right word, push them too hard mm -hmm. with the clients. I let the speakers speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and, they, and then they ask, some people ask questions and want to purchase them. So it's, you know, it's a small way to direct market, but it's working. Mm. Yeah. Well, I have, I have a, 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 I have a pair of um, Ion 2s and an extender in white behind me here. Sorry, here. Uh, but yeah, I saw I your blacks. Would you like to show us your beautiful black finish? Because it's gorgeous. Tell me, tell me. Tell me, tell me when you see them. Okay, hold on. That's it. That's it. Okay, so we see the SSL, and on top there is NS10, of course, and right to the left there is the uh, EN2. Lovely. Oh my God, it is a thing of beauty. Yeah, the black, the matte black kind of rubbed finish is quite nice. It is. I love the white, I love the red, and that's one of the really cool things is that APS is so good, good at offering a color palette that other manufacturers don't do. Yeah. Uh, some of the other colors are you know, really exotic, but they're great. But I, I personally now, I love the pearl white ones that are behind you for a while, but now I've kind of, I think my preference is these black matte ones because yeah. they just look tough. They look they, great. They, and they look kind of, you know, they look at home with this kind of equipment which, where everything is kind of, you know, dark a exactly. shade more than. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think they kind of fit in like they've always been there. So it's like a staple. That's just something that people are used to, kind of like a, the silverness that you see yeah. on a Neumann microphone. Same type thing. Exactly. Yeah. Great. Thanks a lot. I seem to uh, remember there was a um, YouTube video showing um, uh, with the with the showing the studio while they were recording with the Ian ones in gold. I think the golden ones. Or was it gold or something? Yeah, there, we had Ian ones in gold. We did. Yeah. yeah he did some really insane colors yeah. um they look great they look really good yeah. so this so much we can do so we always talk about this but we want to kind of not confuse the market on these speakers as we make the mark mm -hmm. of what they are so um people sometimes ask me why we don't at, a at aps why we don't do any dsp and we kind of feel that uh We want to leave this to much better specialists and we want to just make active speakers. And if somebody wants active analog or rather DSP correction nowadays, they can just purchase something external. How do you feel about that, Troy? I mean, do you use any DSP correction in your room? No, we don't. So uh, I think that's something that if it came up and it was something that clients had asked for or would ask for in the future, we would readdress it and make a decision at that point. Okay. Um, also, people often ask, okay, can I have like basically a bedroom, stick a pair of speakers and correct it with DSP? How do you feel about that? Would you rather, because I mean, people who listen to us and watch us are people who work at, from home mostly. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I often meet with this um, 
situation where, where they spent all their money on the speakers and have no money for the acoustics, acoustic treatment of the room, be it even uh, obviously a you know, bedroom or anything. And what you're feeling about it and what would, you, you know, what would you say to them about the acoustics? How important is it even on their level? I think the acoustics are important. You can't be in a really live room with hard surfaces and standing waves bouncing all over the place. I think it's important that it's kind of, it does have a deadness to it. Um, and they have to make sure that what they're working on in their home studio or their bedroom or whatever the production room is at home, um, it's not always going to be at the A-plus level. You kind of aspire and build up to that. You just got to make sure what you're listening to is really on your tracks. So you have to have a way to be able to cross-reference yeah. it to make sure that the low end is correct and your spacing is right spatially. So I think uh, you kind of have to try to use some basic ear common sense. But, uh, yeah, sometimes you can't do everything at home. Um, and you can't acoustically treat stuff with diffusers and yeah. absorption. I understand that, of course. But, uh, yeah, DSP in that case can be helpful. We live in, a, in, a, in times where a lot is happening in those bedroom producer studios. Yes. Um, Are you sometimes getting clients that have recorded mostly in those um, in those um, conditions and then want to, for example, finish the album at your place? Very hard to say. Probably that's some percentage of the time because you know, with 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 clients being so transient and files being able to move move around so easily now, mm. uh, you don't necessarily know where they were. Uh, it's different than the analog and digital tape days when. Um, tapes had to follow them. Finch Sony Digital or one in Mitsubishi Digital or 24 track analog tape, you had to ship those to the next destination mm. where now it's a file. So I think sometimes things go on in hotel rooms where people are recording something. But generally, I think a lot of the clients that come in here um, are on the three major label music groups in the world being Sony, Warner, and Universal. Uh, that's a large percentage of our business. And I think they do go from professional recording studio to professional recording studio. And some of them have professional recording environments at home. All right. Uh, I like okay. to just, that answer is the question. Uh, I'd like just to say to you guys uh, and girls, obviously listening and watching us that if you have any questions, please do ask them online. And as long as we're alive with uh, Troy, we'll, we'll, we'll be happy to, um, answer them, especially Troy. I'll just pass on the questions, reading them from YouTube uh, channel. Uh, Troy, I have another question then, if I may. Yes, yes Chris. <laughs> um, you obviously have a full analog studio set up, uh, but I guess no, plugins no are important. No more, no more tape machines. Tape no machines, more, yeah. uh, we, all tape machines gone as of okay. about... Uh, Six years ago. Okay, no Studers lying around. No. Okay. Are you happy no. about it? Are you happy to see them go? I I, I wouldn't say I was happy to see them go, because um, we had you know we we had a great um, AA twenty seven with a sixteen track and twenty four track two inch head stack. We had one of each, and I had a custom ATR one hundred two with Ari yes. Electronics, a half machine. But I, the problem was the tape. So I just think the tape manufacturers aren't at the same level that they once were right. when it was Ag and BASF and Quanta G and 3M. So I think that's really been that's really been the downside. And at this point, it's hard to find old virgin tape that's in good condition that you could record on. Okay. But no, the world the world moves on. So here it's a combination of analog and digital in terms of all the equipment. Sure. Um, except for tape. Except for what? Except for tape machines. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you find that uh, because outside of these big studios, the, the the main conversation that I see happen is, you know, is it good to mix in the box or in analog only or a mix of the two? Is this coming in in any way to you guys, or are you just basically it, outside it is, of it this is, bubble? It is. There are clients that come in that when we're talking about mixing specifically, um, it's really one of three ways. They either use the console automation, um, and of course, in conjunction with Pro Tools, or they stay completely in the box, and they really just use the console for level control, okay. um, and they don't touch any of the outboard gear or the patch bay. So basically, and then there's, the and then there's, and then there's the third option, which happens the most. It's kind of half and half. Okay. They use a little bit of the console, 
and a little bit of, of, of the Pro Tools automation and kind of merge the two together. Um, because it's hard to not let stuff breathe through this analog equipment that's here. Of course. Uh, if anyone looks at the website and sees the outboard gear yeah. in each room, it's a tremendous list that's curated on a, on a weekly basis. We, I change Amazing. things quite a bit. So, um, yeah, no, but there, there are people that come in that could stay inside of the box and it sounds incredible. So, uh, we're starting to get to that point now. Okay. There's certain mixers that are great just inside of the box. Uh, some of those people work in their own place. Some work here. It depends. So do they like come to finalize their project? They work a little bit at they home do. and then they just kind of come to do the final finishes taking they, advantage they of the acoustics. All It's all different com combinations, exactly. Because you know, here you're going to get a number of things that you wouldn't necessarily have in a home production studio. You can have the big monitors, a lot of choice of near fields, some mid fields, uh, active, passive speakers, uh, you know, a large array of outboard gear, both digital and analog. Um, and of course, some people come here because they love the solid state logic dualities, um, and then the acoustics themselves. Yeah. Uh, not even counting the live room and the instruments and the ability to record. Yeah. So uh, it really depends. It really depends. And I'll, some clients come in with their laptop and plug into our system. So mm. that happens too. So sure. it's really, you have to be prepared to do everything. So spe Fine. speaking of the live room, uh, the time I went to your studio and had the chance uh, to see it, I saw this beautiful upright piano. Is it still there? It is still there. Yeah. Good. A couple of clients... A couple of clients have tried to purchase it from me, oh and I wouldn't God. sell it. We have a really great Beckstein A2 upright exactly. that we just kind of stumbled upon about 10 years ago. Um, I was getting ready to purchase a baby grand piano for this room, um, Studio One, and I wound up just not doing it and saving the money, and I tried a couple of uprights, and then someone turned me on to Beckstein, and uh, people love Love this piano. It is. Love this it's piano. just wonderful. It's the most wonderful upright piano I've ever heard. It's it record it records well. Yeah, yeah. And plus, I it, mean, right, right, right up there with some of the uprights I think that have lived at Abbey Road over the years. Oh, yeah. another place that a tremendous piano collection. Mm. You've mentioned so many names uh, during our conversation, and I wanted to ask even before we started, really. No, I bet you. I let you mention them. You mentioned them. <laughs> and but you mentioned them, you know, you you kind of when we talked about Abbey Road because I mentioned I'm going there next this this month and it kind of pushed me back to this um idea of this job being really um dependent on relationships. How do you feel about that? I mean, is this like, you know, that that that's a million percent. That's all it is. That's okay. all it is. Um, you know, if it's not the relationships, these all these studios whether it's Germano Studios, the Hit Factory, or Abbey Road, or any other facility you want to name anywhere in the world, it's just four walls and a pile of equipment. So it's the relationships, and it's the staff, it's the engineers, it's the assistant engineers, it's all of that. So the relationships, you know, I know I can't be the only one that does this. My competition does it as well. We work on this, you know, 25 hours a day. Um, you want people to leave these studios and want to come back. Exactly. Because obviously, sports studios are not inexpensive. Uh, but you try to work with everybody. And again, that's a relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good question. Very good. That's a key question. Exactly. And you, we would probably want to encourage everybody who starts in this business to start parallel to his, you know, honing his skills to actually build the relationship list people and something that's really honest. I find that a lot of people will say, oh, well, I, I'll just call everybody up and, you know, email them and wish them, you know, best wishes on, 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 on Christmas Eve. But um, from my side, it's not really that. It's really, you need to have an honest relationship with your clients because it can't be fake in any way. It has to be from the heart, really. That's the way I feel about every client I've worked with. Yeah, it can't look like it's networking, like it's yeah. just a business thing. And, and for any young engineers out there that are watching this, um, you can't develop that skill later on in life. Mm. You need to develop that as you learn how to operate, you know, a plugin or Pro Tools or an analog piece of gear or mm. setting up a microphone. It's as important in the infantile stage as it is uh, uh, at any point in time. You have to develop that skill. The skill is very important. It really is. Otherwise, you know, why are people wanting to go to a certain place? There's a reason that the people that come in create the magic. Mm. Uh Speaking of uh, equipment list and all that, is there 
like a short list of classics that everybody goes to every time they come to the studio? Oh, like, for, for example, sure. if they're recording a vocal, say, what what's the like the you know vocal strip? Would you would you from the top of your head would you be oh. able to say? Sure, it, I mean it's a, it's a Neve 1081 or a Neve 1073 mm -hmm. or a 1084, almost the same thing. Uh, it's a Tube Tech CL1B mm -hmm. limiter, not even a question. Uh, those would be the ones for sure uh, that I'd say off the top of my head. Uh, people aren't using 1176 as much for vocals anymore, but they still use them. Mm -hmm. uh, but those are the main things. Some people still use the Avalon 737. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, on pop and hip hop R&B vocals. Um, same way people are using a Sony C800G, very popular tube microphone. Yeah. Besides a Neumann or a Telefunken U47, U67, uh, Elam 251 or ELA 250, 251 from Telefunken. Yeah. Those seem to be the the most uh, commonly used M Neumann M149, but vocal channel strip. Yeah. It's a combination of the Neve 1081, the Neve 1073 and the, uh, the tube tech CL one B no question. Those are the, those are the three pieces. I find it incredible that, uh, these names go, you know, live throughout history, despite the incredible <laughs> amount of, uh, alternatives that we have. The Neve preamp seems to live on. Uh, it does. I mean, it's a classic product that they got right from the beginning. Um, and their reissues that they sell now at AMS Neve are quite, uh, quite unique. They really are the great pieces. Mm. And, they, and, they, and they tend to not break. So mm. there's very, very little maintenance. You know, always knock wood when I say something like that. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it's quite true. But it, it, it's true. Uh, what about other, um, like... Universal Audio, do you have any of those things, like plugins and s emulations of them? There is this... Oh, yeah. Our plugin list is pretty special. Uh, you know, a lot of the UAD package, The I think we're Ultimate 7 now, we're going to upgrade yeah. to Ultimate 8 yeah. momentarily. Um, and, of course, we have the Waze Mercury bundle here, and it's all listed on my website. Uh, it's an easy button to look at for either Studio 1 or Studio 2. But, yeah, and then, of course, you know, the LA-2A is a, is a big thing here in terms of a piece of outboard gear. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, the CL1B gets used more than the LA2A in vocals now. Okay. That's been the case, I would say, for the last five years. Well, that's good to know. Um, but you can't, not on a, on a, at a studio like this, you have to have LA2As. Yeah. Um, because you can use them for other things as well. Sure, for instruments, bass, and probably guitars. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I can show you the outboard gear yeah, behind my shoulder. Yeah, let's go. Yeah. So we can try to see if we can move the computer. Oh, my God, I can see, see it already. Go. Oh, Jesus. Look at the, <clears throat> you've got three Bricastis as well. Yeah, there's th three Bricastis in each room now. And then, of course, see all the Neves right there? Yeah. Yeah, I see them. Amazing. And then over, over on this side of the room. Oh, my God. This, this, is, this is the land of Chandler. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah. So a lot of the Abbey Road Chandler pieces between both tube the red stuff and the solid state yeah. TG one two three four fives. Yeah, and then you see all the, uh, the limiters. You see them? Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's it's a nice array of stuff, and we love the Bercastes. We recently now have three in each room because we do a lot of surround work. But even when we're not doing surround work, it's just great to be able to have three stereo, you know, reverbs that you can utilize. It's like having echo chambers or you know EMT one forty plates. Yeah. So it's actually a pretty yeah. cool thing. So you is this, we just say again? Is this the mainstay of your reverberation units? That's what people like to use yeah. most. Yeah, the rooms now. Have, I mean, of course, people use a lot of plugins. Sure. But in terms of hard outboard gear, uh, each room now has three Brocasti M7s, and each room has one AMS Neve uh, RMX 16 right. 500 series, of which just came out. The three wide. Uh, reverb. So uh, we're actually adding that to this room later on today. It's been in Studio Two uh, since the middle of the pandemic, and it's actually coming today. It'll get installed either tonight or tomorrow. So uh, that will be a truth. So we're pretty happy about that. Great. So it, did it replace the lexicons and all that? Um, I had a lexicon 960L in the very, very beginning that floated between the rooms, but just wasn't getting used a lot. Whereas at the old hit factory, the 960L was a very popular piece of gear. Um, but yeah, no, we, for the longest time, didn't really have any hard effects. Uh, but now we do. The reverbs are 
been a big addition, I think. It just gives people more flavors sure. uh, that you wouldn't necessarily have at a smaller studio or at home because mm-hmm. um, things, you know, these things are expensive. Oh yeah, but uh, they're they're uh, they're worth it. Yeah, I was um, I was checking out um, the uh, Brucasti against the um, Seventh Heaven, which is a um, like a software version of Brucasti, and well, mm-hmm. well, the hardware is just better. I mean, yeah, it's it's a good plugin. I've got it. And I haven't got the hardware, but when it came in, we corre- we compared it with a friend of mine who has it, and uh, definitely it has know, an edge. I don't, know, I don't know if we have Seventh Heaven or tried that. I'll mention it to the guys later on today. But uh, yeah, we we love the Bercastis, and of course, keep in mind that the founder of Bercasti was a design engineer at Lexicon. Exactly. So because of the old place, before we were in a plug-in world, um, at the main hit factory in the early '90s. There was a 480L in each room and a 224 in each room and a 960L that floated or a few of them that floated, uh, you know, PCM 42s and, you know, various lexicon pieces. So, um, but of course the world changes, Mm -hmm. but then again, it goes back to your comment a few minutes ago, like on the vocal chain, it's amazing all these years pass and a vocal chain at a very high level still tends to be a Neve 1081, a Neve 1073, a TubeTech CL1B, a Universal Audio or Teletronics LA-2A, 1176. That stuff hasn't changed. It's amazing yeah. how that hasn't changed. It is. But there's it obviously is. a reason for that. There sound. is. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, there are some questions popping up. So if yeah. you allow me to just read through some of them, Martel, Martel is asking, being in a very small room and not being able to set up my monitor's listening position at 38% of the room, would it make sense to put my EN2s against the wall? And what woofer settings would you recommend on a 13 by 9 feet room, composing mainly sample-based music on an amateur personal project with no club bass levels? I think without standing in the room, it's hard to really make it that is. assessment. Mm. I think you got to find that sweet spot position that you're comfortable with. And I think you kind of throw the science out the window. They probably shouldn't be against the wall. Uh, really, or the back abutted against the wall. They should be a little bit freestanding. You're not going to have them soffit mounted, obviously. And you're not really there critically, digitally measuring the room. Um, so I, part of it is kind of a gut feeling positioning situation, unless I'm standing in the room or another acoustician designer is standing in the room that could measure properly and then see what the right setup would be. Hmm. I would definitely um, suggest to get somebody to help you out with this because yeah. it might make a tremendous difference to you. We can't be specialists exactly. with, in everything. Um, Gediminas, Gediminas is asking, Troy, how did you like Ian's, the first ones? How can you compare them to other monitoring systems you have used so far? Thank you. Uh, when we say Ian's, we're talking about Ian ones? The first ones, yeah. Yeah, well, that that's what started the ball rolling on this concept when I first met Ray and we met in London, actually, um, he had sent me a pair of Aeon ones. He was very generous and we really liked them. We thought they were, we, the initial reaction even for me is that they weren't offensive. They were kind of soft to the ear. Um, and then when he said, let's try to do something together, then I think we tried to fine tune and copy some of the things, for example, from a Yamaha NS 10 M that you could put in an APS product and make it enhance it, make it potentially better. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Uh, but it, with the Aon One was really what sparked the Aon Two. Exactly, and it's still it's still an offer. And uh, being a, a um, I think half the price, it's a good entry point until you you know break up enough money right. to go for Aon Twos. Right. I I have most of the e, uh, APS speakers at home and. Uh, I found that since I've got EN2s, I basically don't switch as much. I bas- I stay on EN2s and it gives me, you know, everything I need. I don't need to go lower or higher in terms of the size of the monitoring to to check for anything. They just And here and here in the United States, I have many client friends in their home production studios where they have Aon ones. Okay. Um, and I I introduced them to Ray and they wound up buying pairs of Aon ones. This is before we had the Aon twos and one of them has recently upgraded where he has his Aon ones and he also has Aon twos. So, right. um, that's the thing. And we, you know, it's a, this is a, this is a nice, slow, steady build to, uh, hopefully, hopefully down the road. If we'd be, this is, you know, my mouth to God's ears, 
would be this speaker is as important in the home studio environment and the professional studio environment as that vocal chain is with 1081s and 1073s and a CL1B or an LA2A. So we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, well, we're, you know, fingers crossed, and I think we have the potential to do it. So I think so too. Um, Speaking of many uh, monitoring systems, you've got, you know, the, the t- NS10s, the EN2s, the big soffit mount speakers. Um, mm-hmm. What do people do? I mean, they, they like switch between them during the mix or is this a mixed bag? They, it's a mixed bag, but um, we have Exigy uh, custom S412Gs. Uh, those are speakers that are built in England by a designer owner friend of mine um, who used to own Boxer, uh, which we had at the Hit Factory London and we had boxers at the Hit Factory in New York on the 54th Street location. Uh, but some people come in and, you know, when they mix, they don't listen to the big speakers at all. Mm-hmm. Other people use the big speakers here for actually as, as like a near field because you can listen at low volume yeah. because they're soft dome. Um, there's a very good relationship between the Aon 2s and the Exigy S412Gs. Um, that's actually been very, very helpful. But it is a mixed bag. We also have the Aventone CLA-10 uh, passive Yamaha. Some people like those because it's harder and harder to get uh, the, the Yamaha NS10 and the replacement parts that Aventone makes are spectacular. They're great. So their woofers and tweeters are really good. Um, some people use the the little mix cubes, which are the copies of the Oritones. Yeah. Um, I had a pair of Genelec 8050Bs that I had for one particular client that was in here doing a, a lot of records, but they weren't being used by anybody else. So they were in pristine condition. I just got, I just got rid of those, um, reluctantly, but they just weren't getting used enough. So, uh, yeah, we'll see. And there's a lot of other things. We have Adams here as well. Adam midfields, no more Adam near fields because the Aon twos kind of really killed the, uh, the, um, the other near fields that were out there, but the Adam, uh, midfields that we have, uh, have been great. So it's really worked out well. So again, this is very subjective, you know, opinions when it comes to speakers. Uh, everybody's got a different feeling. You can make a you know a great mix on a really bad pair of speakers if you know your speakers and you know your room and your equipment. Um, but uh, it's uh, so far it's a, you know it's the right thing. It's been a it's kind of been a an assortment of speakers and people use what they're comfortable with. I found that um, having done Ian twos with you has been a tremendous help in, in uh, getting the uh, revised version of Classics underway, the Classics uh, 2020, which mm-hmm. uh, I've had and I they've gone now because they're on a demo at somebody's um, somebody else's studio. But um, what I found is that they're pretty much close. They 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 don't sound exactly on the same level as Ian twos, but they're pretty much there in terms of the timbre and what you can expect from a mix. So if you start on Classics 2020 and then you switch to e and twos there are no surprises it's pretty much the same as you said with the soffit mount right speakers that going between the two doesn't i think that relationship's important i mean we're looking forward to getting our first pair of classic 2020s hopefully in the next couple of weeks um i think they're being shipped from poland so that'll be great uh that those relationships are important and i think that's what people look for here and you know half of our sessions at this point are engineered by our staff engineers Mm -hmm. Uh, as the first engineer, not necessarily assistant. Um, and then, of course, it's all the classic, you know, legendary people that walk in and out the doors that have, that, that make the assistant engineers that much better. So sure. we're kind of spoiled to some degree and spoiled mm-hmm. with all this equipment. But we try to keep the things here that get used. I try not to have things around that don't get used very frequently. Okay. We have a question from, I hope I pronounced this well, Why Who Leon? Ian 2 is a two-way speaker. How can it produce enough low end without the sub? It's uh, it's that good info for the. Uh, is it? Uh, hold on. Uh, is it good enough for the low end when mixing? Well, that was part of what we tried to do in the design with 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 Ray and with you guys. Is that the Aon 2 would have the low end that a Yamaha NS10M doesn't have? We believe it has it. If you want a little bit more, you can get the base extender. Um, that was the whole purpose of to make it a three way uh, speaker. So uh, it's worked out well and we don't find it to be bass shy in any way, shape or form. And you can kind of crank these without any distortion or the speakers crapping out. So we believe that the Aon 2 has the low end that's necessary 
uh, for a near field monitor. Speaking of power and levels that you mentioned, uh, I kind of, I'm guessing Americans are working at quite a substantially higher levels of monitoring than we do in Europe. Is that right? Do you feel that? Oh, that 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 is so correct. Um, when I've had this conversation with Matt at Exigy, uh, the levels that people listen at here in New York um, is whether whether it's rock or it's hip hop. It's kind of hard to even imagine. It's quite loud. Um, I think the the speakers get you know a, they get they get beaten up, but they they hold up. So the same thing happens on near fields. There's certain clients that come in. They'll they'll pop in S10s, uh, whether it's the woofer or the tweeter, uh, many times during a session. And again, of course, the problem with that is until Aventone started making the replacement parts, it's really hard to get those parts. Mm. Um, so now that's not an issue any longer. But uh, people do listen loud, and like the Aon 2 handles that quite well. I'm, I kind of had a feeling that it was one of the main parameters you were try we, were, we were trying to get right in order for en 2s to be compatible with the American style of mixing. Oh, I think it was. I think it was one of the main focuses besides that vocal placement, where the vocal sits hmm. actually um, in the sound field as you're listening, uh, very much like an S10. There are. I mean, there's a reason. NS10s, people love them, people hate them, but there's a reason they're sitting on everybody's console in every recording studio mm. around the world for over 30 years. That's not luck. So mm. uh, to have something that's a superior product to that, but yet incorporate some of the great characteristics, mm. that was the idea. As you remember, as we were going through prototypes, and when we finally got that first production model that, that Ray actually drove to me in Frankfurt, from Poland, um, yeah. which was an incredible gesture on his part to see them at Music Mesa, not that we were displaying them, but in a hotel lobby was pretty amazing. Yeah. So, uh, but that was the main thing, I think, during the development of the various prototypes, even before we were in the prototype stage, before we were prototype one, I think we got to four, if I'm not mistaken. We didn't have to go to a fifth one, but it was getting that low end right and not blowing speakers, and not having them, you know, fail. Hmm. That was the key thing. Here now, here's a very interesting thing. Going back to what you said two minutes ago about you, you believe that people in Europe don't listen, whether it's on near fields, mid fields, or large monitors, as loud as they do in America. Mm. That is true. But here's the interesting thing: in the three years that the Aeon twos have sat on both of these consoles, mm. we have only blown one woofer. Right. Wow. That says something for this, you know, for the sturdy design of our guys at the R&D. For people in Poland and in Europe right now, the best analogy is what goes on here at Germano Studios, the hit factory, is, is, the, is the exact same thing that happens in an F1 Formula One race team. That's how this stuff is used. It's the exact same thing. It's no difference than Lewis Hamilton and his car going into the pits happens mm. all the time. He actually records here, which is cool because he's a recording artist when he's really? not a Formula One. Oh my God, champion. really? Yeah. He's done probably 40 sessions here. He's awesome. Yeah, he's great. Great. So he Good sings. Guy. Very talented. Very he sings. Very talented singer. Very ta talented singer songwriter. It's R&B. It's really cool. Yeah. R&B, yeah. Um, I would love to pick your brains about some of your clients, but I suppose you, you don't even have the right to do it, right? All the NDA agreements yeah. and... This is kind of like a, you know, a Catholic confessional. You know, what happens in the studios is, stays, stays in the, in the studio. studios, and maybe it becomes something in, you know, in a book or a movie down the road. But only good stuff, because only great stuff happens. Of course. So, yeah, you're right. You're right about that. Um, I'm trying to think of something. Um, we kind of maybe exhausted the list but i'm not seeing hold on is there any maybe another question down the line here let me check go through the list it's not very long no there isn't one so let me think of one uh, i have actually a little short list hold on ah okay um how do you feel about this push this pull towards this home production taking over basically that's at least what we see in europe um how would you present your studios and the kind of service they can provide 
at your level to people who work in the home studio? What do they gain by getting there, even at some later stage of their production? Well, it depends what stage they want to come in at, but it really, it tends to be just to be able to have the use of the equipment and the various pieces that you would never accumulate at home Mm. would be too expensive, wouldn't make any sense. Um, But we have to be very pro home studio. And of course, you know, whether they're, they're not, some of them are recording studios, but a lot of them are production rooms. They're not really on the level of an A, B or a C level studio. And in, in a lot of cases, they don't need to be. Um, it depends on the type of music, certain electronic music. A lot of stuff gets done in a laptop. There's no question about that. On a plane, it's a different different world. But it also, it's the engineer and the producer that are going to be able to utilize those skills in an efficient way. Mm. And you can do those things at home. So a lot, you know, a lot of the engineers that work here all have home setups, but they're not really working on clients from the studios at home. They're working on a, you know, a different level of clientele, maybe an emerging level of clientele. Um, but you have to be very pro. You can't, can't be like, oh, you know, home studios aren't real studios. No, we're, we're using the same software digitally. We're very much the same. Yeah, maybe the, the track counts aren't the same as home. And maybe the amount of plugins in a home production room aren't the same as, you know, uh, a major world-class studio facility. Uh, but I think people come here based on, you know, what part of the record they want to be in a professional environment. Um, maybe they're doing a choir. Maybe they want to finish the mix here. Maybe they want to mix the entire record here. Maybe they just want to overdub the vocals here, do all the lead vocals. Maybe they just want to cut basic tracks. It all depends. There's all there's all different versions of it. Um, but I, I, I do believe people that are working at home want to come into facilities like this. This isn't the only unique facility in the world. There are others mm-hmm. in many great cities around the world. Yeah. But uh, you have to, you have, there has to be a consistency and a cohesion where you can move stuff from here to home and move stuff file-wise from home to a professional environment. So you use Pro Tools, I suppose? Pro Tools, yeah, that's all we use. And some people work in Logic, but Logic mostly for composition. But some people use Logic as a multi-channel DAW as well. Mm-hmm. But you know, I'd say 99% of the time, Pro Tools. it's Pro Tools. Okay. Yeah. And we just, we just upgraded to uh, Pro Tools 2020.5 and it's actually working quite well. Good. Still Mac? Still Mac, yeah. We have the cylinders. Okay. We have the eight core okay. cylinders, um, and they've worked out quite well. So Good. now the next thing will be, when do we switch to the new computer? But I guess the plugins all have to work. So okay. we're, we're not ready for that just yet. Do you, do you mean the uh, the new uh, computer that Apple is talking about? Correct. The uh, ARM-based CPU? The, the cheese grater, correct. Oh, so the cheese being, grater, still the Intel one, okay. Of, Instead of it being a, you know, a, a, a trash can uh, cylinder, now it'll be a cheese grater again, like the older one. Yeah. So uh, yeah, at some point we'll make that upgrade, but uh, the operating system has to work properly, uh, and the plugins have to work. Uh, mm. That's the third-party plugins. That's going to take some time. Of course. So you're using like a, a HDX? Well, you you have the HDX cards, I suppose. We're, so they are in we're, some. We're HDX three in both rooms. So, so it's so, like we. we Thunderbolt extension box or something that you put them in. Yeah, yeah, and we have the sonnets as well uh, that give us the uh, extra slots for the cards, mm-hmm. which of course the cylinders don't have. Yeah. Uh, that helps us with our UAD plugin as well. Um, so yeah, no, it's it's actually uh, it's worked out quite well. We like those computers, um, but at some point we'll make a switch. Mm. Good. But HDX HDX three has been very helpful, especially on our film score work when we're mixing mm. in 5.1 surround. Some people have, you know, large track counts, a lot of processing, and uh, going from HGX 1 to 2 and then to 3 in each room has been very, very helpful. Most people at home would not have HGX 3. No. That's a, you know, that's a huge system. It is, yeah. Uh, do you see uh, independent indie artists coming into your studio because you mentioned basically three three label i mean the three majors but what about the indie we guys we do indie sessions as well and that's all different genres of music generally tends to be more alter- alternative rock based but there's indie rap and trap sessions that come in people that aren't signed to labels and i try to work with their budgets it's going to be different than the major labels or a major film company or a major broadway cast recording company sure. um you know you, you never know you never know who the next Kendrick Lamar is. Oh yeah. You never know who. 
You never know who the next Tom York is. Yeah. So I think it's important that you have to uh, work with everybody. Yeah. Um, do you have the night sessions in any way or is this? We're, we're 24 hours a day. Okay. And uh, most, most of our sessions occur at night. It's something something I find very strange here back in Poland when I came back uh, from France in 2010 that they don't really do night sessions. It's only from like 10 to 6 or 8 in the afternoon. Yeah, and I think when you go to London next week, um, you'll notice the same thing. A lot of, se a lot of sessions yeah. in London kind of finish by 6, 7, 8 o'clock at night, yeah. um, especially when you're dealing with film scoring and orchestral work. That's a different thing. It makes sense. But I think in modern... Uh, record making at any st even studios in London, people are going to work at night. You know, whether it's rock, hip hop, rap, trap, or pop, uh, those the, the creativeness usually tends to happen after four o'clock in the afternoon. Right, uh, and vocals too, vocals for that matter as yeah. well. A lot of, I mean, we have certain clients that literally aren't going into the vocal booth or the live room until I don't know one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. Right, so, yeah, to each his own. Uh, Martel is asking regarding SPL, SPL you were speaking earlier. What SPL, SPL are you working at on EN2s and what SPL level would you recommend in a small room? Again, that's, you know, it, mm. it varies from session to session. And in a small room, it depends how small that room is. You don't want to damage your ears. So, you know, uh, people, I, I don't even want to start quoting SPL levels. Um, it might be a little frightening. But I think generally, when people are mixing, they're they're listening quite low, as they should. Yeah. So I think we could add that you you have to be aware that ears hear differently depending on whether you're listening at low levels or at high levels. So it's a question of basically experimenting uh, with uh, what you're getting at different levels and finding your own right kind of a you know comfort zone in which. I mean, uh, if, you can hear, if, you can hear all the, if you can hear all the parts of your recording at low level, you know when you listen loud, mm -hmm. if it's recorded properly, it's not going to distort, and it's going to be it's going to be a, there's going to be a balance that is necessary to achieve. Uh, I think the engineers that have been doing this for decades um, have maintained uh, the their health of their ears because they're not listening that loud. You know when you want a club like atmosphere and you want to play something back, that's different, but you also don't want to, you know, distort your speakers and be in a situation where, you know, your signals messed up. So, when you're talking about the insanely loud levels at your studios and in America generally, you're talking about the tracking sessions because, as you say, you seem to be saying that during the mix, it's it tends. I to think it could be it can be tracking or mixing. It's when people are playing stuff back okay. when they want to have that impact and that feel. But um, so the actual it, mixing is at lower levels. Oh, yeah, the mixings. A any okay. great mixer, whether they're mixing at home or they're mixing in these studios yeah. or other studios like this around the world, they're mixing at low levels okay. without question. So that's, that's good question. to note to put that in, like, you know, because we're talking they'll check, about. They'll check, stuff. they'll check stuff at a higher level, yeah. but they're not consistently working at yeah. a high level. Yeah. Okay. Well, I hope uh, this answers your question. Um, we're. We're close to 6 p.m. over here, your noon. So unless... Oh, we have another question then. Let's let's go then. Right. Uh, do you cross-reference mixes at higher or low levels or both? Both. Both. Okay. That both. was a short answer. <laughs> do you have any other <laughs> questions, Martel? Um, uh, Troy, did you uh, actually um, engineer sessions back in when you started? Not really. Not really. I mean, I know the equipment kind of inside and out uh, from just years of experience. And it's also a feel thing as well. Um, I know how everything works, uh, but I'm not actually in the room engineering. I did produce a little bit, but uh, not from an engineering perspective. Yep. No hit records in that regard, but not really time, just really spending uh, my time developing Running. the business out yeah. of it and designing. And now and designing. designing. Yeah. So can you, uh, you were mentioning the uh, Hit Factory name and uh, your hope to see other studios with that name uh, yeah. around the world. What does it mean? Is is it like a form of cooperation or on your part? How do you how do you see that? Again, it could be, it could be a combination of both, whether it's licensing or designing. Um, 
and there's a few projects in the works right now. We'll see which ones finish first. Uh, but it's uh, it's another avenue and a new life for me in terms of having the use of uh, the Hit Factory name, which is really exciting. Uh, it's great to have been able to bolt it onto this name. And oh, now yeah. this is Germano Studios, the Hit Factory, the home of Germano Acoustics. So it's actually been it's been very effective. Well, I must speak to you about Poland then. Some, <laughs> yeah, it could, it could it could happen at some point. Yeah, it could be a conversation. Yeah. It was it was fun coming there. Uh, actually, two years ago, actually next week, I was in Poland. Uh, I remember when we came up to see the Rolling Stones. Yeah, yeah, which was great in the football stadium. I remember. But, that. Uh, yeah, it was that that seems like it was yesterday. <laughs> you were there with with Chris Lordalgi, right? Were you? Chris Lodalci, yeah, who has his CLA tens, um, yeah, and many other products. But yeah, Chris and I had fun. Tom Lodalci was there as well, and uh, of course Ray was there. So it was good. It was a really good, good uh, it was a good, good experience. First time in Poland. Hopefully, be, I, I think I would have been back already had it not been for this pandemic. So we hope to see you soon. Yes, you will see me very soon. Good. Um, well, I think we we have exhausted list of topics unless you Troy have something to add to this conversation no I think we've covered you know the whole gamut um, I hope people have learned some insight here of what goes on on a, on a daily weekly monthly basis mm -hmm. uh, it's a fun place I'm very passionate about the studio business oh, yeah. and uh, you know audio equipment so uh, it's, uh, it's been it's been a lot of fun and I hope other people share the passion Well, then, uh, thank you very much for listening to us uh, talk about uh, shop, talking talking shop about stuff that maybe isn't important to everyone, but certainly is to most people who are in music production. And I hope Troy uh, continues to be your inspiration, as he is for me as well, and his history is incredible. And if you have any questions, please um, write to us or to Troy. Um, and yeah. you, you'll find the email on his website we'll post links obviously to under the film once it's over and um, I hope to see you soon bye for now thank you Chris thank you Troy bye bye That's